Good morning. Welcome to worship at Fresh Presbyterian. Um, if you are worshiping with us, we're delighted to have you here. If you're worshiping online, please maybe put something into the comments section to let us know that you're here. And if you're watching later on in the day or in the week, maybe just send the church an email because it'll be on YouTube after the service. Would you please join me in the call to worship? Grace be with you from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. And also with you. Jesus said, I am the light of the world. Whoever follows me will never walk in darkness, but will have the light of life. And I was remiss. I wanted to also introduce to you our guest minister today, who has been here before, so some of you may remember, Reverend Dr. Clay Brantley. We're very pleased to have him. And I wanted to just let you know a little bit about Clay. He was born in Lake Charles, Louisiana, and attended Texas A&M, Austin Presbyterian Theological Seminary, and Perkins School of Theology. He has been a Presbyterian pastor for 36 years, serving churches in Malvern, Arkansas, and six churches in Texas, in Sherman, McKinney, Garland, Whitesboro, Denton, and Trinity McKinney. Clay's passion for those who are other, so that they are other no more, has taken him on mission trips to Guatemala, Honduras, El Salvador, the US-Mexico border, Cuba, Palestine, Israel, Egypt, Lebanon, and Syria. He has participated in a civil rights pilgrimage in this country and speaks and leads conversations around racism, particularly at the Retreat House Spirituality, Spirituality Center in Richardson. Five years ago, Clay left the local church he was serving to follow a mystical path, a call into a deeper following of Christ. This journey has led him into deep soul work, to being a wild Mustang, and to the Retreat House. He is an artist, speaker, spiritual director, and published author. Clay has led numerous retreats and conferences at Gilmont Conference Center and around the country, both for youth and for adults.
Clay serves as a participant and director at Retreat House, where he is the guide for two monthly meetings, contemplative painting, and the writer's gathering. Both of these monthly meetings allow Clay's soul to dance in unexpected ways. Clay is married to Krista. They have two children, Drew and Michaela, a daughter-in-law, Julie, two dogs, and a turtle. So we're very pleased to have Reverend Clay with us this morning. And let us now join in singing hymn 32, I Sing the Mighty Power of God. <laughs> Please remain standing as we join together for the confession and pardon. The proof of God's amazing love is this. While we were sinners, Christ died for us. But because we have faith in him, we dare to approach God with confidence. In faith and penitence, let us confess our sin before God and one another. God of mercy. Jesus Christ, to seek and save the lost. We confess that we have strayed from you and turned aside from your way. We are misled by pride, for we see ourselves pure when we are stained and great when we are small. We have failed in love, neglected justice, and ignored your truth. Have mercy, O God, and forgive our sin. Return us to paths of righteousness through Jesus Christ, our Savior. Amen. Hear the good news. Our righteousness is found in Christ alone, a gift of God by faith. Beloved people of God, believe the good news. Through the grace of Jesus Christ, we are forgiven. Thank you, God. May mercy, peace, and love be yours in abundance. The peace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you. And also with you. Please share the peace of Christ. Put those around you.
Yeah, I think so. Yeah, I think so. <laughs> So, but the, but the thing is, when David, when, when Samuel looked at the first older brother, he thought, oh, I'll bet he's king. And God said to him, no, Samuel, I don't look at people the way you do, the way humans do. I look at what's inside, in the heart. <clears throat> and so it made me think, have you guys ever heard anybody say, don't judge a book by its cover? Yes. Yep. You know what that means? Yes, it means someone might look like scary or really nice, but really it could be really mean or really nice. Oh. That's right. It could be anything inside that book. And it's kind of the same with people, right? I mean, you might look at somebody and think, oh, I love that jacket. Look at the pretty pink on the inside and the maroon on the outside that matches your dress. And so that's a very nice person. Or, oh, you know what? That shirt, it's tailored, it looks great, and you're smiling, I'll bet you're a nice person. But sometimes we look at people and we think, their clothes aren't very nice. Their clothes are kind of dirty. I wonder, I wonder if they're nice. And that's what we're doing, is we're kind of judging a book by its cover. Because we're not looking at what's inside, we're only looking at the outside. But God never does that. God looks at what's inside what's in our hearts, and what's in how kind we are, and how good we are, and how much we love our neighbors. So next time you, you hear the phrase, don't judge a book by its cover, you can think of Samuel picking <laughs> King David to rule Israel. Okay? Should we have a prayer? Dear God. Dear God. Thank you. Thank you. For all of your blessings. For all of your blessings. For us to look at someone's heart. For us to look at someone's heart. And know them not because of what they look like. And know them not because of what they look like. But because of who they are. But because of who they are. One of your <laughs> beloved children. One of your beloved children. We thank you, God, for teaching us to look at a person's heart. We thank you, God, for teaching us to look at a person's 
heart. And we thank you in the name of Jesus. And we thank you in the name of Jesus. Amen. Thank you so much for coming and joining me. <laughs> okay, I think we got folks waiting for you there. Enjoy the lesson. And I would invite everyone at this time to tear off the little flap on your bulletin and register your attendance with us so that we know that you were here and any concerns you have that we might need to address. This morning is Helping Hands Sunday and there should be uh, envelopes in the back of the chairs for any donations you might like to make. And it is also birthday Sunday. And you will find the names of all of the birthday babies on the back of your bulletin. We'll announce them later in, uh, in the narthex when we sing happy birthday. But I'm pleased to let everyone know, uh, at least I'm pleased, uh, that we have a special strawberry fluff cake. So if you like strawberry, you will enjoy that. Um, do we have any other announcements this morning? Okay, in that case, um, I'm going to move on into the prayer. Lord, prepare us to hear your word. Quiet our minds and hearts so we may listen and learn. Bless us, Lord, we ask, now and always. Amen. Our first reading is the one I mentioned to the children. It is from 1 Samuel, chapter 16, verses 1 through 13. It can be found in your pew Bible on page 259. Please listen for God's word. The Lord said to Samuel, how long will you grieve over Saul? I have rejected him from being king over Israel. Fill your horn and set out. I will send you to Jesse, the Bethlehemite, for I have provided for myself a king among his sons. Samuel said, How can I go? If Saul hears of it, he will kill me. And the Lord said, Take a heifer with you and say, I have come to sacrifice to the Lord. Invite Jesse to the sacrifice, and I will show you what you should do and you shall anoint for me the one whom I name to you. Samuel did what the Lord commanded and came to Bethlehem. The elders of the city came to meet him trembling and said, Do you come peaceably? He said, Peaceably. I have come to sacrifice to the Lord. Sanctify yourselves and come with me to the sacrifice. And he sanctified Jesse and his sons and invited them to the sacrifice. When they came, he looked on Eliab and thought, Surely his anointed is before the Lord. But the Lord said to Samuel, Do not look on his appearance or on his height, the height of his stature, because I have rejected him. For the Lord does not see as mortals see. They look on the outward appearance, but the Lord looks on the heart. Then Jesse called Abinadab and made him pass before Samuel. He said, Neither has the Lord chosen this one. Then Jesse made Shema pass by, and he said, Neither has the Lord chosen this one. Jesse made seven of his sons pass before Samuel, and Samuel said to Jesse, The Lord has not chosen any of these. Samuel said to Jesse, Are all of your sons here? And he said, There remains yet the youngest, but he is keeping the sheep. And Samuel said to Jesse, Send and bring him, for we will not sit down until he comes here. He sent and brought him in. Now he was ruddy and had beautiful eyes and was handsome. The Lord said, Rise and anoint him. 
for this is the one. Then Samuel took the horn of oil and anointed him in the presence of his brothers. And the spirit of the Lord came mightily upon David from that day forward. Samuel then sent out, set out and went to Ramah. Here ends the reading of the Old Testament. Amen. Thank you, Bell Choir. Our second reading this morning from the New Testament is from the book of John, the ninth chapter, verses 1 through 41. And it can be found on page 102 of your pew Bible. As he walked along, he saw a man blind from birth. His disciples asked him, Rabbi, who sinned? this man or his parents, that he was born blind? Jesus answered, Neither this man nor his parents sinned. He was born blind so that God's works might be revealed in him. We must work the works of him who sent me while it is day. Night is coming when no one can work. As long as I am in the world, I am the light of the world. When he had said this, he spat on the ground and made mud with the saliva, and spread the mud on the man's eyes, saying to him, Go, wash in the pool of Siloam, which means scent. Then he went and washed, and came back able to see. The neighbors and those who had seen him before as a beggar began to ask, Is this not the man who used to sit and beg? Some were saying, It is he. Others were saying, No, but it is someone like him. He kept saying, I am he, but they kept asking him, then how were your eyes opened? He answered, the man called Jesus made mud, spread it on my eyes and said to me, go to Siloam and wash. Then I went and washed and received my sight. They said to him, where is he? He said, I do not know. They brought, they brought to the Pharisees the man who had formerly been blind. Now it was a Sabbath day when Jesus had made the mud and opened his eyes. Then the Pharisees also began to ask him how he received his sight. He said to them, he put mud on my eyes, then I washed and now I see. Some of the Pharisees said, this man is not from God for he does not observe the Sabbath. Others said, how can a man who is a sinner perform such signs? And they were divided. So they, began to, so they said again to the blind man, what do you say about him? He said, he is a prophet. The Jews did not believe that he had been blind and had received his sight 
until they called the parents of the man who had received his sight and asked them, is this your son who you say was born blind? How then does he see? His parents answered, we know that this is our son and that he was born blind, but we do not know how it is that he now sees, nor do we know who opened his eyes. Ask him, he is of age, he will speak for himself. His parents said this because they were afraid of the Jews, for the Jews had already agreed that anyone who confessed Jesus to be the Messiah would be put out of the synagogue. Therefore, his parents said, he is of age, ask him. So for the second time, they called the man who had been blind, and they said to him, give glory to God. We know that this man is a sinner. He answered, I do not know whether he is a sinner. One thing I do know, that though I was blind, now I see. They said to him, what did he do to you? How did he open your eyes? He answered them, I have told you already, and you would not listen. Do you want to hear it again? Do you, sorry, um, do you want to hear it again? Do you also want to become his disciples? Then they reviled him, saying, you are his disciple, but we are disciples of Moses. We know that God has spoken to Moses, but as for this man, we do not know where he comes from. The man answered, here is an astonishing thing. You do not know where he comes from, yet he opened my eyes. We know that God does not listen to sinners, but he does listen to one who worships him and obeys his will. Never since the world began has it been heard that anyone opened the eyes of a person born blind. If this man were not from God, he could do nothing. They answered him, you were born entirely in sins and are trying to teach us? And they drove him out. Jesus heard that they had driven him out, and when he found him, he said, Do you believe in the Son of Man? He answered, And who is he, sir? Tell me, so that I may believe in him. Jesus said to him, You have seen him, and the one speaking with you is he. He said, Lord, I believe, and he worshipped him. Jesus said, I came into this world for judgment, so that those who do not see may see, and those who do see may become blind. Some of the Pharisees who were with him heard this and said to him, surely we are not blind, are we? Jesus said to them, if you were blind, you would not have sin. But now that you say, we see, your sin remains. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. It is good to be here again. It's always interesting when you have someone else read your bio. I think, wow. 
I've done a lot of things, been a lot of places, married to Krista for 35 plus years, two wonderful kids, but the thing that people ask me most about is the turtle. And we have had Franklin for 24 years. A friend brought him over to our house when he was just a puppy and thought our son needed a turtle. And Drew was five. Drew's now almost 29. So that tells us about how old the turtle is. He lives in an aquarium all by himself. Krista feeds him and work, talks to him every day. And there he is. I noticed some of you from the Retreat House Spirituality Center, of which I am one of the leaders, and uh, glad to see you, uh, a lot of times all on Zoom, uh, but I invite you to check out the Retreat House Spirituality Center. We are located at St. Barnabas Presbyterian Church in what was the old man, so we sit kind of behind the property and across from Richardson High School, so it's not too far from here, so just check us out. This story from the Old Testament, the anointing of David to be king, is one of my favorite stories. I love simply telling the story. It gives us some interesting insight into how God calls and chooses leaders. It's a 3,000-year-old story, but, but maybe it has some relevance for us today, and maybe for First Rockwall as you are in a search process, who, who will be your next pastor? In our story, God is done with Saul. Things started out well, and then Saul started thinking about Saul and what was best for Saul, and things started going poorly. Samuel is grieving over Saul, perhaps because there were such possibilities with Saul, and perhaps just because, how do we pick this guy? But God has told Samuel, stop grieving over Saul. He's ready to move on. So I ask the question, does God place God's Spirit upon people for just a season and then move that Spirit onto someone else? That's an interesting question. I just ask you to sort of sit with that. How does, how does God work when it comes to leaderships? Another way to ask the question is, who left who? Did God choose Saul and God was powerfully present to Saul, but Saul and his own choices about what was important. If you want a good description of Saul, read the prayer of confession that you read earlier. That somehow Saul, so full of himself, couldn't see that maybe Saul turned his back on God. But God is unfolding God's purpose. And if God is not making much progress with one person, does God then shift to someone else? That seems to be what our story is telling. Just kind of sit with that. How does God work when God is putting God's Spirit upon people? So God tells Samuel, grab your uh, flask of Oil, I am sending you to Bethlehem. I have chosen me a new king, one of the sons of Jesse. Well, Samuel sees a problem with that. Saul is still king. It would not be good for Samuel or for that son of Jesse if a new king was anointed when Saul was still king because Saul's rather crazy. And so Samuel explains this to God. I, I can't just walk into Bethlehem and anoint a new king. Now, the next move is interesting. God says, well, 
Don't tell them you're coming to anoint a new king. Tell them you're there for a sacrifice. That's not really why Samuel was going to Bethlehem. So is, is God telling just a little bit of a white lie? A little, little deception being played here? It's interesting, that is what Walter Brueggemann, an Old Testament scholar, says. I think what's happening here is it gives us an insight into how God works. That in a world where Saul is still king and will be for another 15 years, God knows that he still has God's purpose unflowing, but has to do it in the politics, in the world of humans. So, so God's willing to say, Samuel, just, just tell them you're there for a, a sacrifice. Huh. The workings of God. That God works in and through humans and through our own brokenness and mistrust. God's still unfolding. Samuel shows up to Bethlehem. And sure enough, the elders of the town come out and they are trembling. Because Samuel, they know of Samuel. He's a great prophet. And if he's come as a friend of Saul, well, that's not good. If he has come as an enemy of Saul, that's really not good. So they want to know. Why are you here? Can you feel that, that anxiety? What's going on? Why are you present here? And Samuel says what God told him to say. I am here for a sacrifice. Get ready. Get sanctified. And so Jesse and his sons were sanctified for this the sacrifice that's going to unfold. I always picture that Jesse is standing there and he is tall and he is proud and he has his seven sons standing there with him. Seven. That's the perfect number, right? In, in the Bible, you know, the devil, 666, seven's the perfect number. Seven days of the week, seven. If you have seven sons, you do not need any more sons. You've got seven. I know, some of you are thinking, why would you want seven? But seven's the perfect number. And so, Samuel looks at the, the oldest. I, I always imagine that they're kind of lined up in order of birth. And Eliab is the oldest. And he is tall. And he is strong. And so Samuel says, oh, it's got to be this one. Oh, this one. To which God says, do not look on outward appearances. For you humans look upon how someone looks, and, and how tall they are. But God does not look on outward appearances. God looks upon the heart. God looks upon the heart. Now we get that part about humans, right? Looking on outward appearances. Do you know that there is a bias when people are hiring, that the hiring people will tend to, Toward the taller person. Nice to be six one. And we know with with whatever, however society, society defines beauty, right? That that person is the one that they'll go. Oh, he is so handsome, or she is so beautiful. There's this. Uh, I don't know if you've follow social media. I don't really, but I know of this. There's a gymnast who's at LSU, and I don't know how good a gymnast she is, but she has quite the following on social media because she is very attractive. 
She is making millions of dollars a year through social media. And, and you can do that now in case you haven't been following. As a uh, college athlete, you can now make money off of the looks of your appearances and your name and such. Again, because she's such a, an attractive person, she has lots of followers. Millions of dollars worth. Do you know what churches tend toward whenever they're looking for their next pastor? Usually a man. Tall. Beautiful wife. Two children. But God looks upon the heart. Let me ask you a question. If God were to look upon your heart, what would God see? If God were to look upon your heart, what would God see? Now, I don't know most of you, but I know most of you. Don't be too harsh on yourself. Because oftentimes we humans are looking straight at our shortcomings, don't we? But God is looking upon your heart. That capacity to love and have compassion and to be present. Hold that. And as you're thinking about who your next pastor will be, how will you not look on outward appearances as much as upon someone's heart? Hmm. Because if we believe this story is true, which I think it is, what it tells me is that God may have already selected someone to be the next pastor of this church. That it's not just the roll of the dice and to see who's available and how many forms you get and all that. That there's an unfolding process that is divine. Back to the story. So we've got the seven brothers lined up. Eliab is the first one. Nope. Abinadab is the second one. Nope. God didn't choose him. Shema, the third one. Nope, God doesn't choose him. All goes through all seven sons. Again, the Lord says, Nope, nope, nope. Well, there's all the seven sons. So then Samuel says to Jesse, Is this all your sons? And then that classic line, Well, there is this other one. He's keeping the sheep. He's the eighth son, not deemed important enough to come to the big gathering of the sacrifice. Has a task to do. He's got to keep the sheep. He is by far the least of these. And you know, God tends to favor the least of these. And Samuel says, to Jesse, get him. We, we will not go forward until he's here. And then, and who knows how long they had to wait. But finally David comes. And <laughs> our text tells us that he was of ruddy complexion, beautiful eyes, and was handsome. So God doesn't look upon the outward appearances, but upon the heart. But our narrator wants us to know that David was really good looking. <clears throat> anyway, uh, God says to Samuel, that's him, anoint him. And there, in front of his brothers, imagine what the dinner conversation was like, 
that evening, they anoint David, who was probably 15 or 16 years old. Now, I'm not recommending that for your next pastor. In, in today's society, the presbytery probably would not approve of a 15-year-old to be the next pastor. I'm just saying. you got to work in the system. But, God saw something in David. And David, of course, becomes the greatest king of Israel. The writer of many songs. All his life, his heart was for the Lord. Did he make mistakes? Oh, yes. It's a soap opera of mistakes. And yet, what happens in the end every time? David comes back to the Lord. He comes, there's, there's a, a willingness to rent his garments and to plea for God's forgiveness. Again, I said earlier, it's going to be 15 years before David becomes king of Israel. There's a lot of stories that have to happen, right? David and Goliath, you know all those stories. But what is the heart? So I want to read to you a poem that I find is very descriptive of the heart. And as I read the lines of this poem, I want you just to engage with where your yes is. Okay? Where is your yes? Now, I have to say up front, I read this poem at my son and daughter-in-law's wedding that they asked me to officiate. And so, I often cry. Because it's so powerful. This is a, um, it's called The Invitation, and it's by Oriah Mountain Dreamer. It doesn't interest me what you do for a living, I want to know what you ache for. And if you dare to dream to meet your heart's longing. It doesn't interest me how old you are. I want to know if you will risk looking like a fool for love's sake. For your dream. For the adventure of being alive. I want to know if you have touched the center of your own sorrow. If you have been opened by life's betrayals or have become shriveled and closed off from fear of future pain. I want to know if you can sit with pain, mine or your own, without moving to hide it or fade it or fix it. I want to know if you can be with joy, mine or your own, without it, if you can dance with wildness and let the ecstasy fill you to the tips of your fingers and toes without cautioning us to be careful, be realistic, remember the limitations of being human. I want to know if you can live with failure yours and my own, and still stand at the edge of the lake and shout to the silver of the full moon, yes! It doesn't interest me to know where you live or how much money you have. I want to know if you can get up after the night of grief and despair, weary and bruised to the bone, and do what needs to be done to feed the children. It doesn't interest me who you know. Or how you came to be here. I want to know if you will stand in the center of the fire. And not shrink 
back. It doesn't interest me where or what or with whom you have studied. I want to know what sustains you from the inside when all else fails. I want to know if you can be alone with yourself and if you truly like the company you keep in those empty moments. <clears throat> now, I don't think David was there yet, right? He's only 15 years old. But David had the capacity to live. David had the capacity to stand at the center of the fire when all the world around him was in flame and stay faithful to the Lord. So sometimes when leaders are called, it's not simply because of what they have done, but because of what they can do. When you're looking upon the heart of somebody, you're looking upon who they are. And ultimately, upon their capacity to say, yes, yes, yes. Amen. Our affirmation of faith is printed in your bulletin. Would you please let us stand and say what we believe? I believe in God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, God's only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Ghost, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sitteth on the right hand of God the Father Almighty, from then he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Ghost, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Please be seated. Let us come before God in prayer. Let us pray. Marvelous and gracious God, you look upon our hearts. You know who we are and the depth of our being. Oh God, you know there are times when we lie to our own selves. Help us to see the truth. Help us to see that we are created in your image. That we are loved and beloved. That we are people of grace. People of mercy. People of joy. God, there's much around us that makes us afraid to live. We live in a society that has many conflicts, struggles, injustice. You know, O oh God, that the temptation for us is to close our eyes. But remind us again and again of your call to be your people, to love to challenge, to live out of our own hearts. God, we believe that you are unfolding your journey here in 2023. You've not stopped. That you are calling and stirring people to task. Oftentimes, tasks that they're not prepared or even ready for. But you send your spirit and you send your people forth 
so that your story will continue. Oh God, as we look around at the hunger in our world, the homelessness, the ongoing war, racial strife, we see so much. But we know, oh God, that you are still sending your spirit upon people, that you are looking deep into our own hearts. Send your Holy Spirit. Help us to respond with a yes as to what you're calling us to be and do. God, we pray for this church in this time of interim and this time of searching for their next installed pastor. Guide them to who you are calling here. Help them to look upon the heart and not only outward appearances. To your glory, to your praise, we pray this in Jesus' name, who taught us to pray, our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors and lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Let us continue our celebrations of God's goodness to us by offering our gifts to God. up your hearts. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. God of compassion, we praise you that you look upon our frail lives with love and understanding and that you desire for us all new life in Jesus Christ. We are overwhelmed by your love, which goes to the cross for us, endures the grave, and leads us to new life. By your spirit, strengthen our souls to be brave and bold in Christ's service. Take our offerings and use them in us for your purposes. In the name of Jesus Christ, our crucified and risen Lord. Amen. Amen. Our last hymn is Lead Me, Guide Me, number 740.
the Lord were to look upon your heart, what would the Lord see? How is the Lord stirring on this day with God's Holy Spirit to perhaps anoint you for the task that is yours to do? And how is the Lord leading this church in the search for the next pastor to come? It's an old, old story of which we get to participate. So may you say yes. May you say yes. May you say yes. In the name of the Father and the Son and of the Holy Spirit. And let the people say, Amen. Amen. Thank you.